Welcome to a very special Christmas celebration episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. We're not going to worry our heads about brick walls or primary sources or the non-existent 1890s census today. No siree. In this episode, we are only allowed to bask in memories of the Christmases of long ago, which I hope will bring a smile to your face and a little joy to you this Christmas season. We have so many traditions in our family, everything from oranges in the toes of the stockings to a contest to see who can find the pickle ornament on the Christmas tree to going over the names of Jesus at the dinner table as we open our Christmas crackers. And I've got the house all decorated, including my little pink Christmas tree in my reading corner by the fireplace. Yes, you heard me, (laughs) an all pink Christmas tree. I like foo-foo things. And this is definitely a foo-foo, girly Christmas tree. And I pulled out the family history Christmas wreath that I made last year, and I've hung that up. And this year, I am actually working on a new Christmas stocking for myself. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it done in time, but I am very optimistic. Um, The stocking, it's kind of a tribute to all of my female ancestors. And guess what color it is? That's right. It's foo-foo pink. And it's pale lavender and other pastels and things. It's going to feature photographs of all my grandmas and great-grandmas and so on. And if and when I get it done, I will definitely show it to you. I'm actually pretty excited about it because I wanted to do this. I wanted to make myself a, a new stocking for a long time. But I really wanted it to be something special, something that kind of reflects my love of family history. And I think I'm on the right track, so we'll see. But before we go any further down the Christmas track, we have a little bit of business to do because it's time to name that tune. recognize that mystery song from the last episode? Well, our friend Jeannie in Illinois did it again, and she called in to enlighten us. Hi, this is Jeannie from Illinois. Your tune for today is I'll See You in My Dreams, an enormously popular song in the middle 20s, uh, written by Gus Kahn and Isham Jones. Enjoy your podcast. Bye. And yes, indeed, she is correct. And once again, it turns out that there are about 150 versions of this song in iTunes. And I found several on YouTube as well, including one of my new favorites, uh, which was by Joe Brown. Lonely days are long Twilight sings a song All the happiness that used to be Soon my eyes will close, soon I'll find repose, and in dreams you're always near to me, I'll see you in my dreams, Hold I love that on the ukulele. Isn't that neat? Well, it turns out that I'll See You in My Dreams was a big hit for Cliff Edwards, who also performed it on the ukulele. In fact, he was known as Ukulele Ike. And you can see a video about Ukulele Ike and the song in the show notes. Now, to be honest, this is my favorite song on the entire Cook Mystery Reel to Reel tape. And after learning more about it and hearing other versions, um, it really is even more so. And I guess I'm not alone because this song probably ranked in the top five of popular songs when it was published back in 1924. Now, I couldn't find it in the Library of Congress website, so I actually ordered a 1940s sheet music on eBay for a, get this, a whopping 29 cents. So thank you, Jeannie, for giving the song back its name. 
And uh, Phil Hayes actually wrote in and told me that his mom also had it in about 15 seconds. No problem. So that is so cool. You guys are very talented. And, of course, I have another mystery song to play for you. So get your musical thinking caps on and get ready to name that tune. Okay, if you think you know the name of that song, please email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Or better yet, leave a voicemail on the voicemail line at 925-272-4021. Okay, now that our business is done, it's time to go back in time to the Christmases of yesteryear. And our first stop is December 24th, 1968. Where were you in 1968? Well, back then, the three-man crew of Apollo 8 became the first humans in history to orbit the moon. Their hastily planned mission saw them enter lunar orbit on Christmas Eve after a three-day voyage from Earth. In one of a number of scheduled live TV broadcasts from the spacecrafts, the crew pointed their black-and-white camera at the lunar horizon and read the first ten verses of the Bible's book of Genesis. Profile America, Friday, December 12th. Many U.S. families will go out this weekend to buy and put up their Christmas tree. While the use of evergreen trees to celebrate the winter season occurred even before the birth of Christ, the first printed reference to a decorated tree was in Germany in 1531. Almost half of U.S. households now use an artificial tree. A third still put up and decorate a real tree, and the remaining 20% do not include a tree in their holiday observances. Christmas trees are grown in all 50 states, and each year's crop is worth nearly half a billion dollars. North Carolina is the leading producer, followed by Oregon. China is the leading producer of artificial trees. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. As I was doing my Christmas shopping and buying English crackers for my Christmas table, as I do every year, I got to thinking about a trip that I'd made to Scotland uh, many years ago, and the first time I ever saw crackers being popped at the Christmas dinner table. I will never forget my friend's 90-year-old Auntie Nancy, a very dignified English lady chatting away politely with me with a very silly red paper tissue hat perched upon her head. So I thought it would be fun to ask my friend James Mowat of the History Zine podcast to tell us a little bit about the history of Christmas in Britain and describe how our British ancestors might have celebrated the holiday. So without further ado, Mr. James Mowat. So here we are, teetering on the edge of the holiday season. And Lita has asked me to give a flavour of how it's celebrated in the United Kingdom. 
and some indicators of how the various traditions have grown up in the collection of countries which make up the UK. Well, I've taken this brief but become so fascinated with the origins of all the Christmas traditions that I've winded it a little and tunnelled back all the way to begin at the year 4000 BCE with the Nordic festival of Yuletide, which would begin on the winter solstice the 21st of December. The 21st is, of course, the shortest day of the year, and this is a time when darkness reigns and many of the trees and plants that people would rely on had now died off. For this reason, there will be much focus upon the life that remained in evergreen, such as holly and mistletoe. Holly would be hung round the door to ward off evil spirits, and the mistletoe represented fertility. So it was considered a mighty fine idea to kiss a girl under a sprig of mistletoe. I have more to say on the subject of Christmas kissing, but I'll come back to that a little later. Light was brought to this time by the Yule Log. This was lit on the 21st and kept burning for 12 days throughout the festival. All these traditions are still alive today, although the Yule Log is not as practical as once it was, with modern heating systems. A large burning log shoved between the bars of an electric fire is not considered a welcome addition to the Yuletide period. These days, this tradition is represented by a chocolate log decorated by icons such as a robin redbreast and sprigs of holly. Yet again, both representing life struggling along in this season of scarcity. Another item you might see perched atop a chocolate Yule log is a candle. This follows the same theme as regards light, but it seems the origin of this has much to do with the Jewish celebration of light at Hanukkah, which involves the lighting of candles and gift-giving. Now, I've mentioned gift-giving there, and it seems this is a theme of all these traditions. For Yuletide, this then from Thor giving gifts to people, and there was gift-giving involved with Hanukkah and the Greek and Roman traditions of Saturnalia. So how did all these various customs become so enmeshed with the Christian celebration of the birth of Jesus? And was Jesus even born on the 25th of December? Or if not, when was he born? Now, the answer to this last question is very hazy. I've consulted a number of references and they all seem to disagree about who set the date of December the 25th when it was set. But if we say it was set in the 4th century of the Common Era, then we're somewhere close. As to when Jesus was born, then we have to look for clues such as in the dates of the ministry of John the Baptist. It's quite likely it was about 2 BCE. So by our usual reckonings, it seems he was actually minus two years old when he was born and he was born in probably autumn or spring so the only thing that's really certain there is that it wasn't the 25th of December the 25th of December it seems was chosen to coincide with the Roman festival of Saturnalia as Christianity spread the missionaries adopted more and more of the many local customs this was done originally out of desperation the various peoples already had firmly established customs for this time of year and would tend to focus more on them than on the birth of Jesus. And we look back now and we see this tactic of desperation turn out to be a really good strategy. This enabled Christianity to become a focus for the lives of the new converts. The holly was adapted to become the crown of thorns and the many songs sung at this time were rewritten to become carols celebrating the birth of Jesus. I would have dearly loved to see the scenario where a priest approaches a local leader and informs him they now have new words for his songs. It sounds most implausible, but it shows how such a consistent effort over a long period of time can yield remarkable results. While some would argue that it was divine intervention that lent a helping hand to the activities of the priests. Either way, it was a remarkable achievement. It seems I've said very little about British tradition so far, so I'm going to jump forward to the Victorian era, that's the 19th century or the 1800s, to see how modern day traditions were shaped then. We have several new innovations in the 19th century, which include decorating a Christmas tree, the giving of cards, caroling, and Christmas crackers. 
Decorating Christmas trees was actually a German tradition. It originated in the 11th century and was brought from Germany by Queen Victoria's husband, that's Prince Albert. He originated from the Saxon Duchy of Saxe, Coburg, Saalfeld. He brought a Christmas tree to the palace from Germany and the custom spread from there. The giving of cards also originated at this time, being borrowed from the already established tradition of sending cards at Valentine's Day. It started around the 1840s and was helped by the introduction of the penny post, and by 1860 there was a special rate introduced whereby you could send unsealed cards for only a halfpenny. Now, I must mention carol singing. This activity seems to me to be one of the strangest traditions, and in many communities, groups of people will go around from door to door singing Christmas carols. They are then occasionally invited in and given a drink and possibly a mince pie. I've seen this happen less and less in recent years, but I've fond memories of my mother keeping what seemed to be an open house over Christmas, with vast numbers of people popping in to say hello, some of them singing carols, and share drinks and mince pies with them. It lends a wonderfully warm atmosphere to the season, as well as a strange sense of unreality. The last one on my list there was Christmas crackers, and Christmas crackers were invented around 1846. A London sweet maker named Thomas Smith put little love notes on his sweets and rigged up the wrapper to make a small explosion when pulled apart. This innovation morphed into what we now know as Christmas crackers. These Christmas crackers are often made of cardboard, then covered in crepe paper, and have two little pieces of card running through the centre, and they're joined by something that makes a little explosive snap when you pull them apart. On Christmas Day at the dinner table, you'll have these crackers laid all over the table. You'll hand one end to your neighbour at the table, and you'll take the other end, then you pull them apart, and whoever ends up with the largest section wins whatever goodies are inside the cracker. It's rarely sweets nowadays, more likely to be small trinkets such as a mini sewing kit or a compass or a tiny puzzle. There'll be a paper hat to wear inside there, plus some traditionally terrible jokes of the kind that make everyone groan. And how bad are these jokes? Well, I'll give you a few examples and you can judge for yourselves. But first, I want you to picture the scene. I know many of you will have British ancestors. I want you to imagine them sat around the dinner table. The men are wearing woolen suits, starched shirts and ties. The women are tightly corseted, bustled and wearing long dresses made up of large swathes of material. The look has been deliberately sabotaged by the strategic placement of cheap paper hats upon their heads. These hats were trophies from the Christmas crackers, and wearing them with pride, they unrolled a piece of paper containing the joke. Question. What do you call a three-legged donkey? And the answer is, of course, a wonky. <laughs> Question. Where did Napoleon keep his armies? And the answer to that is, in his sleeves. <laughs> And finally, because I know you can't take any more, why didn't the ghost go to the dance? Answer, because he had no body to go with. <laughs> I think you get the idea. Groans abound, but the tradition of diabolical jokes in Christmas crackers continues. The jokes would be read, the goose would be carved, and alcohol consumed in quantity. Looking around the room, you'd see Christmas cards on the mantelpiece, holly and ivy hung over the doors, and a coniferous tree adorned with baubles standing in the corner. Your British ancestors would eat several courses, then adjourn to the drawing room, where the family would gather around the upright piano to sing a few carols. There would be several glasses of sherry atop the piano, and a plate or two of mince pies. And then they might play a few games, such as charades, or blind man's buff. The feasting and merriment would continue. Family and friends might visit, bringing cards and presents, and eventually, as night falls, everyone would disperse. Your Victorian family would retire to bed, to rest so that they might get up early, and possibly go to the horse racing on Boxing Day. Now, I said earlier that I'd come back to the subject of Christmas kissing, and that's an excuse for me to get a little nostalgic about my youth. 
I can remember in my youth being terrified of girls, and yet fascinated by them, as so many young boys were, and of course still are. There were girls I would have liked to have kissed, but would never dream of asking them if I might. There was a tradition, however, of Christmas kisses, which were an absolute godsend to a frightened little rabbit such as myself. At this time of year, it was considered acceptable to ask a girl for a kiss, and she quite often would oblige. Mostly, you just got to give her a fleeting kiss on the cheek, but occasionally she would react much more favourably, and many schoolyard romances would begin around the Christmas period. I don't know how widespread this custom is, but I can remember being very grateful it existed at the time. So, much of the modern UK Christmas was invented in the 19th century and popularised by stories such as Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. There is much feasting, merriment, and exchanging of gifts, and some people still go along to a church and meditate a while on the birth of Jesus. These are just a few of the many and varied Christmas traditions that hold sway in this part of the world. There are a whole host of others, such as Father Christmas, Sherry, Turkey, Stuffing, and Boxing Day, as well as peculiar things to do with New Year's Day, coal, and dark-haired men. I'll leave those until next year. Bye for now, and happy Christmas to you. I can truthfully say to you all that we children at home are full of cheerfulness and courage. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers, and airmen. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. That was Princess Elizabeth of England in 1940, along with her younger sister Margaret sending Christmas greetings over the radio airwaves to the children of England. Now, stepping further back in time, we come to the year 1917, and the song, Christmas, Christmas, Blessed, Blessed Day, performed by the Metropolitan Quartet.
That was the Christmas Eve music box, also known as Fantasy and Old German Christmas Carols, a solo performed by Robert Gaylor on the Celesta. Now, you may recognize that familiar sound of the Celesta from the Nutcracker. Well, a Celesta is a struck idiophone operated by a keyboard. It looks a lot like a, a miniature upright piano or kind of a large wooden music box, but it has a lovely vintage sound, doesn't it? Now, our next Christmas song is from 1913. It's the Bells of Christmas, a collection of Christmas carols entitled Prince Emmanuel, performed by the Edison Band with Bertie Bell, Frederick W. Eek, and I.H. Meredith.
and home to every climb. Hot with joy, that's Christmas time. Right before. Build up Christmas, let your story. Earth is filled with heaven's glory. Right before the Prince of Peace. Right in hearts and joy in dreams. Feel the music driving well. With us well. Christmas just wouldn't quite seem like Christmas, even back in 1911, if the story of Scrooge was not included. Well, music hall performer Bransby Williams, who was born in 1870, recorded the classic Dickens story for Edison Records. Fifteen shillings a week. Hmm? What's that? Fifteen shillings a week? 
Well, how the devil can a man and his wife and children live on 15 shillings a week? Uh, I'll begin by doubling it. Yes, I will. I'll double it, then I'll double it again. Yeah, I'll double it again if I like, of course I will. I can if I like, I suppose. Double it 15 times, of course I will. <laughs> Oh, dear, dear, dear. I've got to bump catch it and see if I can make his wife and his little ones happy. What a change, what a change. And only yesterday, as Ebenezer Scrooge walked through the city streets, people would point and say, you see who that is? Hmm? That's Ebenezer Scrooge. Wicked old miser Scrooge. Oh, poof. Ah. But now, with God's help and strength, they shall say... You see who that is? Why, that's Ebenezer Scrooge, the reformed miser. The man who cares for the widows and the orphans. That's him. <laughs> well, now then I must be off to Bob Cratchit's little home, make his wife and little ones as happy as it's possible to be. <laughs> and now in the words of little tiny Tim in the dream, here's a merry Christmas to all the world. And may God bless us, everyone. Ha-ha! Do you know it's Mary Bells? Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> Mary, Mary Bells! <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this trip back in time to the sounds of Christmas is of long ago. I'm pretty lucky because I've already received my Christmas gift, and that's you. Thank you for spending your time with me here on the podcast. Thanks for all your great emails and your voicemails, for sharing your ideas and, and sharing the show with your friends. This show is really a joy to create, but that's really because we're sharing it together. I hope you have a wonderful time with your family this holiday season. I count myself a very blessed woman indeed to have a wonderful husband, Bill, who was my first supporter in this funny idea I had to start podcasting. And of course, big fat slurpy kisses go out to my three amazing daughters, Vienna, Lacey, and Hannah. We're all going to be together this Christmas, and it just doesn't get much better than that. I hope that you'll find yourself surrounded by your loved ones and you have a marvelous time. And I know we're going to have a great time together in 2009 talking about genealogy. So until then, Merry Christmas. Thanks for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.